will be selling this to the FBI. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Amber Spycast, your one-stop shop for all things His Dark Materials. Your His Dark Materials materialists are joining you again here to talk about our next chapters. Um, I'm joined. My my name is Alaric, and I'm uh, joined here with, by Travis and Joanna. And Joanna, as always, will kick us off with the recap. All right. So we started um, reading with chapters 14 and 15 this time around. Um, and here's our summary. During one of their planned stops, the Egyptians are attacked by a group of Samoyed traders who steal Lyra and take her straight to Bolvanger. Always thinking, Lyra quickly assumes the identity of Lizzie Brooks, a younger and more dim-witted version of herself. At Bolvanger, Lyra is processed by an expeditious nurse named Sa Sister Clara and her pert little white dog, Demon. Sister Clara makes Lyra disrobe and change into clean, albeit secondhand clothes, and takes her to the dormitory where she falls asleep. Lyra is awakened by a group of curious girls who fill her in about where she is and speculate about what is happening at the compound. The next morning, Lyra finds Roger, who is overjoyed to see her and begins to plan their escape. With the help of Roger and Billy Costa, Lyra discovers a hiding place in the ceiling, which she quickly recognizes as a potential escape route. Scientists weigh and measure Lyra and Pantalaemon, studying the effect of dust on humans and their demons when they are interrupted by a fire drill. Lyra meets up with Billy and Roger to take a look around outside when Serafina Pecola's bird demon Kesa suddenly descends from the sky. Kesa tells Lyra that John Fa is only a day's journey away then notices she is trying to enter a locked door marked Entry Strictly Forbidden. Lyra explains that she thinks they are cutting demons away from children in that room, so Kesa helps to unlock the door. In glass cases all around the room are the ghost-like demons of all the severed children. Filled with anger, Lyra and Kesa free the demons from their cages, then Kesa helps them take the form of birds so he can fly them to safety. Back in the courtyard, Lyra enlists Roger and Billy's help in getting the children ready to flee when the Egyptians come to their rescue. As the commotion from the fire drill dies down, a zeppelin cuts through the dark and prepares to land. As snow swirls on the ground, Lyra sees Mrs. Coulter and her golden demon peering from the window of the airship. Any hot takes on these chapters? Love them. I love these chapters. <laughs> oh, Travis is back on board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. These were, again, just like um, there was a there was a set of chapters uh, a couple a couple times ago. I can't remember the chapters now. Where there was it was short, but so much happened, and I feel like this is the same kind of thing. There was so much packed into these. Um, and and the action starts pretty quickly from the beginning. I mean, you just get this little this little hint like, hey, we're taking a break. And then the whole expedition is attacked and they don't know from from where or whom. And and, and then Lyra's taken. And that that was a, that was, I think, a really good, you know, it, it kind of broke up some of the a lot of the exposition parts that kind of just, it keeps building the story. And then he always knows when to just throw that action right in there to to keep you coming back. And that scene was so so epic. I mean, I just imagine it being cinematic in my head, and you know these long shots of arrows coming out of the sky at the Egyptians, and um, yeah, just just a, a really powerful imagery in this uh, in this ambush scene. You know, I just uh, kind of wanted to sh to shout, "It's a trap!" at some point <laughs> right. while I'm watching this. And while I'm reading this, I, I say watching this as though it's a show because it, I, I have that, like I said, that uh, that that visualization already going on. It's just really powerfully done. Well, the the arrows coming out of the darkness, and you know, the, the, they're sort of silent in a way, and the only real awareness of being attacked for some were that people were felled, right? And it's like sort of in silence in a way, and and the, they're slow to react to the attack. Um, as trained and strong and as as uh, aware as the Egyptians have been up to this point, 
this is a, a true ambush. They really were not ready for this. And Lyra realizes that. I, she feels I mean, bad. It, she does. She's just like, John Foss should have known and I should have been helping him to be aware of this. Like she totally realizes how they dropped the ball and in, and in what kind of a big way they dropped the ball because she sees John Foss go down. Mm -hmm. And we and don't know how bad it's going to be. We have no idea how bad it is at this point. And then she's I, kidnapped. She's, I'm, she's yeah, she's no, I know she's kidnapped. And and is it you know at this moment is she, has she been targeted specifically? Is it something they're they're on the hunt for children, or is this a opportunistic attack? Um, it's not it's not clear whether like oh they they have a kid we're going to attack them and take the kid, or it's just sort of an opportunistic oh there's a kid we can get paid for this. Well, and earlier in the chapter, Lyra sort of is pondering. She's like you know. I don't know where Mrs. Coulter is, but the spy fly is, is that at least shows that they're still looking for me. Mm -hmm. So, and the kind she, you know, he kind of prefaces it that way in the beginning. And then when they get attacked, she's like, she believes it's Mrs. Coulter coming to get her. Um, and only after she's been like manhandled and, and thrown, you know, thrown in a bag and thrown in the back of a sledge, she starts to realize um, when they stop to talk to her that these are not. They don't know who she is. They have no mm -hmm. idea who she is. And so then she, again, just lightning fast, says she's somebody else. Lizzie Brooks. Lizzie Brooks. Her alter her, ego. Her ability to switch into, you know, different little uh, alter, alter egos is, uh, like, weird. Like, almost supernatural, right? Mm -hmm. like, it, like, her ability to just become another person seems... A, it doesn't seem consistent with her age, and I don't mean to mean that as a criticism by any stretch. It seems that uh, she really has like this ability to, uh, you know, they've they've talked about it multiple times to uh, to deceive, like that is her superpower. Yeah, and and you know she is uh, frozen st solid at this point. She's been on this sledge, and she speaks of how cold she is. They, they yank her out to give her a piece of what what dried reindeer meat to mm -hmm. gnaw on. Uh, and and you can only imagine that her senses are not only is she frozen and she's thinking about how cold she is, but you got to think she's a little dull at that moment, too. She's disoriented and she's able to come up with this pretty quick, um, mm -hmm. no, or at least being aware enough not to give up her real name, which I feel like a large group of the population would even accidentally say their own name. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you right now, if that was me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm snitching on myself. That's, that's how it works. <laughs> Who are you, Travis? Sorry. And, you know, if they catch me, I'll say I'm Travis too. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then not only again, this is just, this is where 11 year old Joanna would just perish. She eats, you know, she's chawing this like reindeer jerky. And then she's like, ooh, I better put that spy fly in my shoe. Yeah. And so homegirl just like slides it down her boot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just like, what? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. And and it's and it's perfect and it's great, but it's just, you know, it's just again one of those, one of those little Lyra isms, like those li like it's just so Lyra to be to be that about your wits. Mm -hmm. Is this a good time to jump ahead a little bit to her description of what lying is. Yeah. Um, at the beginning of the 15th chapter, the demon cages, there's a, a little bit of like, a, Oh, you guys might've noticed that she's, you know, she's a liar. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I think about what makes a good liar. And one thing that struck me is that Pullman says, and, and here that a lack of imagination is important to be a good liar. Isn't that interesting? I loved that. Yeah. I loved that. That was fantastic. It, it's, it's striking because I guess if you asked me walking down the street, we were having a conversation about lying, I would say lying, uh, having an imagination would be important to lying. But mm -hmm. this is such a crystal clear example of why it would not be a good example or, or a, good, a, a good liar ha having imagination. It would be too it would be too big like someone has to a lie has to sort of 
land and resonate and not be too big and not be too small and sort of be this like right down the middle. Um, it's it. That sort of was interesting to me. Yeah, I love the line where he says, you know, many good liars have no imagination at all. It's that which gives their lies such wide eyed conviction. And, and that's, I think, p- part of what you're saying. Like, if you had this imagination that you were able to conceive of these impossibilities, then the lie, you wouldn't be able to convince anybody that, there, it, that something was a lie because of the, that, uh, your ability to sort of see this bigger thing. But if you don't have an imagination and you're telling this lie, it's almost like you're, you're shocking yourself. Do, do you know what I mean? Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so then you're like, and so, and then becomes credible. Without spoiling, I'm uh, I'm a little suspicious that this is going to play into the L- Philip Pullman's larger themes later on in the series. Uh, yeah, I think so. So um, she's taken finally and gets to Balvanger, and is you know. It's a mysterious location. Um, there's a um, uh, lights, uh, a path of lights that leads to nondescript buildings. Um, it's obviously very, very cold. Um, although it's warm inside the facility, so warm, in fact, that the person that checks her in at the door is like freezing cold just being sta- standing outside the door, uh, not really dressed for the occasion. Um, it, it's a, uh, it's a facility that's mysterious, but we've learned enough about what's going on there, what we believe that's going on there, that there's an amount of suspicion as you're reading it, sort of waiting for, um, multiple shoes to drop as to what she'll discover. Um, what was your take on what Balvanger is sort of looks like at this point? Uh, one, one thing that sort of struck me was the bland food and the, um, uh, the unusual um, staff that have very little going on mentally. <laughs> they're, right. they're a little slow and their demons are, are dim. Uh, and and uh, this photogram of a beach in the mm-hmm. commissary. Like, what, do you, what was your take on that? This felt like this was the first locale in this in the book so far that felt like a place from our world it it felt like a you know a corporate facility um sterile you know white linoleum floors white walls a drop ceiling i think they they uh mm-hmm. describe in the cafeteria it's um and then, you know, that big photo photogram that uh, suggests, hey, you're someplace else, you know, um, really just screamed, you know, uh, corporate corporate entity to me. It feels modern in a way that none mm-hmm. of the other locales have been. Um, and you're right about the drop ceiling. That that, that was a, a major point that I wanted to talk about is she's never seen a drop ceiling. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm just picturing like the two by two tiles with the drop ceiling grid, like you would see at any school Mm -hmm. or even in my, my own office building. Um, what is, is it, why does it look like that? It's appears to be built. It it must've been built more recently, Mm -hmm. but the architecture in the rest of the world doesn't seem to fit inside of this design. I mean, to be fair, like she's her entire world is Jordan college before this. True. So everything has that feel, mm-hmm. you know, so she's starting to see what the rest of the world looks like and it's pretty bland and corporate. <laughs> yeah, just like the food. Exactly. Well, and sort of like the people too. I, I mean, I, I was, I, I appreciated the description and, and what you were, and what you were saying here just now, like the bland food and the, and the pictogram and things, but you know, the first thing that she notices when she gets there is that the person who comes to get her looks like a Jordan scholar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everywhere else we're seeing these descriptions of people that, you know, the people that took her, they had these wide Asiatic faces and, you know, and, um, you know, the way they describe the Egyptians, but 
it seems to me, and maybe I'm treading on thin ice, but like they're all kind of Caucasian-y people <laughs> that are taking, do you know what I mean? Like there's just like a bunch of white people taking kids and they're all up in this, because she said, they, I don't know, they look like a Jordan Scholar and I, I wasn't exactly sure what that meant because they were, you know, she describes everyone else in this other way but describe mm. these people looking like a Jordan scholar. And I, I don't know, maybe I jumped to a, to a conclusion, but that was well, something like, that struck me. So, so it's like, what is a Jordan college person supposed to look like? Right. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, Egyptians are Brown and this and that, and this eight wide Asiatic face. And it was like, Jordan, you look like a Jordan scholar. I'm like, what does that even mean? Yeah. yeah. But. So, uh, you know, and, and this is another uh, good point of comparison between um, the books, the Golden Compass movie, and the BBC series. Mm -hmm. BBC series, you know, uh, the master uh, is played by, um, gosh, I forgot his name, but it's the the dude from The Wire who's uh, incredible. Mm -hmm. Great voice. But, right. And then, um, you know, in the movie, the all the Jordan College guys were, were white guys. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and I think it's really easy to fall into that uh, when you're thinking of uh, the descriptions in the in the book. Um, and I think a lot of that is our own biases because the book doesn't describe any of them. You mm-hmm. know, it doesn't right. give any of them descriptions. But we, you know, put our own uh, personal biases uh, onto it. So, you know. but the, but the lack of description, I think, is also sort of. A little bit of a trap there because if they're just if you're describing every other group of people outside mm-hmm. of jordan college you know what i'm saying like mm-hmm. the lack of description is kind of what makes you go oh i guess they must be white because these guys are this and these guys are this and these guys are this but you're just jordan so oh, yeah yeah you and know what i mean yeah yeah because yeah, that that is something that has bugged me in fiction forever you know you'll have the chocolatey description (laughs) of a dark skinned character and then um you know uh somebody else is just uh bob you know we never get the (laughs) disc what he looks like right you know so it's totally true i think there's a meme about that now oh yeah there's a meme about everything oh (laughs) many many memes many memes uh i i really appreciate how she's sort of dimmed herself down um for her time here and and how carefully she like when she sees roger how carefully she approaches him knowing that she doesn't want him to freak out and say her name or to let on that he knows her especially knows her very well um and even pan's preparation for roger's demon to sort of say (laughs) You know, take take it down a notch. You know, mm-hmm. calm down because the demon's going to freak out too. Uh, I appreciate her planning and her precision while still keeping this ruse. I, I, I uh, she's she's a she's a practiced liar up to this point, but she's a planner and she's a thinker and she's always thinking one step ahead. Um, I love when the fire alarm goes off and she goes out into the into the wherever she goes out front. Um, she knows how disorganized they are, the staff. She knows they are not as skilled as teachers. She uses, they, we use that term uh, as sort of organizing children. The list they have, they have some master list that just has everyone's name on it. No one's broken up into groups, but I thought it was a really cute description about how that was going down. And then she just throws a snowball. That's all she has to do to get the kids to go crazy. Because they've been cooped up inside. She knew that the perfect distraction for a bunch of kids that have been cooped up in a dentist office with a, <laughs> you know, a, a pic- picture, a wish you were here picture on the wall is to throw. A, we have abundant supply of playthings here called snowballs. And who doesn't love to throw a snowball? The distraction and the technique for that was just brilliant. Like, perfect. Well, they say that, uh, you know, when Roger immediately picks up on her um, on her subterfuge, I'm this is something that they've done a hundred times. You know, they've had a million campaigns across uh, Oxford as they uh, get into their war games with all the other kids. 
she know they they've done this they've been preparing themselves for something along these lines forever and you know it's like i talked about i, I think a couple of shows ago you know why lyra her her abilities you know seem they they fit the character because she is uh she's she's actually prepared for all of this stuff these are all things that uh you know she unwittingly has uh, lived her life towards right the uh so this of course leads her to this the demon cages um and then the meeting with seraphina's demon Mm -hmm. um which i love the technique for unlocking doors with snow Mm -hmm. um i just love it's the simplicity of it and um and her demon is obviously quite wise and studied and understands uh, you know, Lyra just wants to smash all the cages, which is an instinctual response to what she's seeing. But the demon's like, hang on a second. I've got a better way to do this, and we can still have the same outcome. Um, it's that particular part, and especially Tony's empty cage. Um, this was That was the sort of punch in the gut scene that we got. And, you know, it only takes place over like 90 seconds, you know, cause she goes back outside and she, they reference it. It had only been a minute that they had been inside of there. The, the weight of that and seeing those demons, those ghostly demons without their humans, which we don't know where their humans are. We know Tony's dead. We know his demon, you know, disappeared as soon as he died, but these lost demons and what, what are we going to do with them? How do we, how do we bring them back to their, owners and and how we or not their owners that's a terrible word um how do we bring them back to their humans um that was a that was a little bit scary Mm -hmm. i could see that was another cinematic something i could really see in my head playing out um especially for this upcoming series this is something that could really land and and you know if we're we're really going to get into the um nitty-gritty of these demons and what they mean in this world this is going to be a, a pretty shocking scene. How are they going to depict that? That that sort of lost and confused and and um, terrified and ghostly demon without its its human. I think you just hit it. You know, it's going to be, you know, these these confused little creatures, these confused little animals that don't, you know, n- have a purpose anymore. You know, I, I mean, every all the other demons that we've seen, they're they all have the per they all have purpose. Even the the children's demons, which is to protect and care for their humans, mm. and these these demons won't have that. They'll and that'll be reflected in the fact that they're you know half beings now. They they barely exist. Mm-hmm. Well, and then there's that heartbreaking paragraph where once they f- once they free them all all the little demons like cluster around her feet mm-hmm. and they're like you know plucking at her leggings and you know and though it says um even though the taboo held them back they were still trying to you know to have some kind of human contact and, and it's so sad she says she could tell why poor things they miss the heavy solid warmth of their human bodies um, and long to press themselves against a heartbeat. And it was just such a sad, a sad thing. And then it was even sad to see them once, once Kesa is like, you know, we need to get these all, we need to help them all turn into birds in some way mm-hmm. and get them, you know, the, the amount of effort it took for the demons to do that. Um, some of it was pain, you know, it was literally hard for them to do it. Some of it was exhaustion. It was hard for them to do it. Um, it was just really, it was really a sad, really a very sad um, part indeed. And then it's, and then that means their children are somewhere alive. Like, where are these other children? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, ha, are they just out wandering? Have they just not died yet? Right. Um, it, it seems that Mrs. Coulter, what, what the kids believe is that most of the intercisions take place when she's there. Like, mm-hmm. she likes to watch this. So it's been a little while. She's been gone for a little while, right? And it, did, it does say how often she comes back, right? I feel like it does say, I'm not, we, it'll be too hard to find, but I feel like it says, you know, oh, she's due back. Like the kids know when she's coming. Mm-hmm. Like there's, she has a regular schedule. And of course mm-hmm. she comes at the end of these chapters. But she's, um, 
that could mean that Tony was among a crop of kids that were just let go, although he's ref- he's referenced as a survivor, you know, someone who lived a little would maybe have lived a little bit longer than someone would normally. Mm-hmm. Uh, so where are these kids? Yeah. You know, if we can go back to the the demons for a sec, you know, I, I was just thinking about um, the discussion that they had about uh, Tony when his uh, demon was uh, cut. Inter intercised inter. Well, I'll we'll figure out the the verb form of that <laughs> at some point. But um, how he never really thought about very much. You know, his his demon didn't change because Tony wasn't the, the, the brightest bulb in the box either, you know, and um, it, it, it made me think, you know, go to connecting, you know, Ly- our discussion earlier about Lyra and her ability to change personalities. You know, let's think about how fast uh, Pan changes into different uh, animals, you know, and um I, I, I'm guessing that's a, a reflection of Lyra's natural ability to, to switch between, uh, you know, different personalities, right? Mm-hmm. Well, and I think uh, it's also just her, 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 ap- her absolute, her intellect and her, like, it's also her awareness of things and her depth of feeling for things. And that's why Pan, you know, will turn into a hissing wildcat if he sees, you know, Mrs. Coulter's demon or he'll turn into this little mouse if he's if he's scared or whatever um i found that so fascinating because part of what happens then when we learn about tony is we get a little bit more of a clearer understanding that like it's kind of it's like it's like puberty you know like when they think it's time for you to be cut Mm -hmm. and so when they or just before or just before so when they take tony it's because he was in a linen room with this girl, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, and again, in whatever, whatever, you know, maybe they were stealing a kiss or maybe they were just holding hands and talking, but you know, that kind of, you know, and so they thought, I guess he was, because his demon wasn't changing that he was at the point where they needed to, to cut. And they also said that he thought he was, you know, they thought he was um, younger than he was cause he was smaller, mm-hmm. but in reality he was actually, you know, obviously closer to that age than we, than we maybe would have thought. Um, but I found it, I did, I found it fascinating that if you were sort of slow witted, your demon didn't change very much. Mm -hmm. And that was such a cool thing. But, but then again, yeah, I I would, I'm agreeing with you in a very roundabout way, Travis, (laughs) (laughs) you know, that, you know, Tony's dim, um, is just highlighted by Lyra's. I mean, she's like a firework, you know, light show. Mm-hmm. Was the girl that they end up taking later the girl that Tony was in the closet with? Bridget. They take Bridget. I Is she know. the one that Tony was in the closet with? Good question. I I had read it that way, but I'd have to go back yeah. and double check. I had read that it was because she was sharing she was sharing that in the group with the kids. Mm-hmm. And then the nurse comes in and kind of sees them talking and then I believe calls her out. Maybe it wasn't yeah. Bridget, but I think they do call her. Okay. Mm-hmm. What did you think of the tests that they did? The dust tests. They're sort of monotonous and there's nothing. They don't, I'm like, what? It, you know, they have, I, the, they um, weigh them. Uh, they uh, have them reach inside a box. I can only picture the the Dune pain box, <laughs> but um, or Gravity Falls, the pain hole. Oh, the pain hole. Yeah, it's like uh, don't, you know, like reach in. Oh no, no, you're not going to get hurt. Go ahead and put your hand in there. And I'm like, don't put your hand in there. She puts her hand in there, and there's, you know, there's she has to hold. They're, they basically put a, a electricity through her body. Mm-hmm. Um, what are they measuring? Like, what are they really getting out of this? I do like that she's like. A, Oh, you know, is this for dust? And he's like, how'd you find about dust? She was like, hey, listen, I took a shower today. I don't have dust on me. You know, whatever. Like, I sort of like how she's sort of playing that up a little bit. Um, weird tests, though. Weird, a long list of tests. It is. And yeah. they seem so inane. I mean, they really do. Yeah. It's like you're measuring, you know, and it almost feels like those kind of things that, like, when you look back in, like, old medical history books, like, you know, when, like, like yes. when you can, like, read the bumps on the skull or something. 
yes. chronology. Isn't that what that is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like that at some point was considered some kind of a very hard science. And now we look back and we're just kind of like, what? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of these things were just sort of, you know, like, you know, let's see how big, how tall are you? And how, I mean, I guess, and maybe they're just checking for like literal physical changes as your body changes for puberty. But mm -hmm. I mean, have they never met a child? Like, have they not gone through, like, you don't change, like, there's not like a moment where all of a sudden you hit the, you know, the certain height and the certain weight and the certain whatever, and now you're exactly what we need. It, yeah, it doesn't know. seem like that's Overnight, how it plays out. Overnight, my beard just came out, and it's I like, was boom. from right. 12 to 13, and just doof. Right. <laughs> it's just, but no, what it reminds me of are um, the, um, I think it's the McDougal experiments um, into the weight of the soul, where they came up with the 21 grams 21 thing. 21 grams, yeah. And, um, that, that's, that's, that's what this all kind of, uh, sounds like to me. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's living in that, that sort of pseudoscience mm -hmm. sort of realm, but there's certainly, they're getting something out of it, whatever it is, or they're at least tracking something. And we don't really know how dust reacts to these kids yet, it seems. Um, but it does seem like puberty. They want to get it done before that. So that's certainly something. And if you took a kid, a real life kid and we're trying to figure out when puberty would kick in, I guess even now we wouldn't really know. Right. Um, we'd have to do, I don't know what kind of tests we would do on a real kid, but it would be sort of hard to track. Your know, Lyra's mm -hmm. also lucky because she's also small for her age. Mm -hmm. So she's still kind of, you know, she doesn't have any, she's not nervous that the indecision is going to happen on this particular visit. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's certainly aware that it could happen at any time. I'm still frustrated by the verb form of intercision. Oh, it's intersized. What would Ooh. it be? Intersized. Like intersized. Hmm. I, I feel know. like we need to coin the term. Intersized. There you go. Intersized. Okay. I'll take it. Um, there's a there's a great she he uses a great descriptive word for when she's she's sort of scared about going in for these tests a cold drench of terror isn't that wonderful that is awesome mm -hmm. I like that I've never heard it used that way and I just love it um, so yeah. I I got I got there's something that I'm just thinking about as we're talking about um, just kind of bull of anger as a whole. And we're talking about, you know, the tests and we're talking about the building and things. But, like, there were two characters that Lyra crossed paths with. Sister Clara is one. Like, where we get, like, a, you know, a lot of good dialogue. And then there's the second, and I don't know, I think it's just a random doctor. They don't really say his name. But it's when she's sitting and eating the stew before she goes um, to the dormitory to go to sleep. And... They were such terrible, terrible, terrible people. Um, the description of Sister Clara, you know, they, it, it talks about her and her dog, that she's brisk, like she's very expedient. She just kind of does her thing and wants to get it done. But there was something about this little white dog that made Lyra very uncomfortable, like kind of creeped out. And instantly it made me think of like Dolores Umbridge. Like this idea that, you know, this... this exactly who I thought. Yes. Same like... Oh. Right. Like, like she's hiding behind this little like, you know, mm -hmm. like that. I can't even do the little like noises she makes that are so horrible because of what she's hiding underneath. And I felt I felt that when I was reading about Sister Clara and her pert little dog. Um, I think that goes to what uh, we were talking about earlier um, with you know, about the people who the, the personnel at uh, Bolvanger. Um, I think that the, the term is that, that the banality of evil, mm. you know, that's, mm. that's exactly what this is. I mean, these are just your basic dull people facility, everything, you know, to us as the, as the audience, mm -hmm. but so many horrific things are happening there. Right. Yeah, well, and, and, then, and okay. I was just going to say that, and these people's demons are aware of what's going on here. You know, we sort of see how Pan reacts to an intersized child. These, these 
demon, the demons of this, the staff have to be either desensitized or also similarly evil to sort of be aware of this and allow it to continue to happen, knowing how important that connection is. Um, how do they dull their own senses to sort of continue to let this happen? Right. I, I, it almost makes me think of the giver when they when they take their little pill every day to, you know, just to keep everybody from feeling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at some point, Lyra gets so tired and sleepy after she eats this stew and the girls wake her up and she was like, I don't remember anybody giving me a sleeping pill, but that's what she felt like. She felt like she, you know, she woke up kind of groggy and with this headache and she had felt like she was drugged. And I wonder if that's not something that's sort of mildly happen happening with the staff to keep them complacent and to keep them you know, moving and doing what they need them to do, like just sort of dulling them slowly with something that they're eating or drinking or or something. But I did, I thought of that. This feels like, um, I kept thinking of Pleasantville. Like she comes into Ball of Anger, which is a, you know, black and white world where the kids have been dimmed a little bit. Their light has been dimmed. They're sort of going through the motions. And this technicolor kid comes in and she's already causing people to regain some of their color and mm -hmm. they're starting to awaken a little bit even just a little bit um you know they sort of sneak around and 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 they they wake her up and talk to her at night but she's clearly going to be the one that is going to make something happen there we don't know what it is but she's going to make something happen she says i'll pull their alarm she doesn't even know where it is right you know She'll pull the alarm. She's going to go up in the ceiling. She'll be the first one to go up in the ceiling, crawl around. Like she's going to make something happen, and 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 she's going to help these kids no matter what. And you I can think... see, oh god, no, please. Well, I was going to say you can see too that they know this. Like the other creepy part I was kind of talking about was when she's sitting and she's eating the stew, and she's you know he's like, how did you get here? And she was like, they kidnapped me. He was like, no, they didn't. They found you. You were mm -hmm. lost. Yes. And it made me feel so gross. It was this, it was like the worst kind of gaslighting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, so, you know, anytime she, she came up with a, a you know, a, a, a truth. No, they, no, they took me. No, they are not. He was like, oh, no, no, no. You were lost. Don't you remember? You, your father couldn't find, you know, and, and giving her these false memories, which if we understand, you know, which we know, I mean, I'm not, saying I, I, you know, I'm doing research, but we know that there are a lot, you know, you can kind of, you can influence children's memories. You can kind of create false memories, particularly with children. Mm -hmm. You know, this is why in, in trials and things that you have to be very careful with the way that you direct a child when they were trying to recall something because you can really influence that. And it was just such a disgusting, just a, such a disgusting um, act. Mm -hmm. And oh, a child yeah. who doesn't have the same sense of self the Lyra had right. would fall for that quickly, just like the the other kids. That's right. You know, if they if it weren't for who Lyra is and what she is, this the totally would have worked on her. It's why they want the sort of forgotten kids. They want mm -hmm. the kids that are sort of on the fringes. Um, it's why the boldness of the gobblers being more aggressive with who they're taking is obviously backfiring because they have you know, kids that are more self-aware and less, less, you know, less able to be influenced. Um, it's, there's, and, and, you know, the, he's awful. He's calculated. Um, the nurse is sort of, um, has, has purpose, but the disorganization and the frustration of some of the other staff, like when the alarm goes off, the doctor she's with, she's with is like, Oh, I mean, right. I guess we have to do, Oh, She's like, can I get my clothes? And he's like, I guess. You know, he's like, they're so, like, they, they don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to be at all interested in what's, what's going on there. It doesn't seem, but they're just sort of going through the motions, maybe just like the kids are. It seemed to me that they had something else they'd rather be doing. Anything. Anything. Right. He right. doesn't want to be and, doing these tests. Mm -hmm. Right. But, you know, what is it? Like, clearly this isn't the job that they want to do. But it's not so much that they're repulsed by it, they're annoyed by it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so 
what what else would these guys rather be doing? Is there another part of this experiment that ha- that we haven't seen yet that they that they're just hoping to get to? They want to get past the the kindness and care for these children and just get to the let's get, let's get to the intercision. Let's cut some demons. Mm-hmm. You know, that's do what they I've, all know that intercision is what happened. They have to, right? They have to. Oh, it's not that so. big a facility. Yeah. Clearly, they seem to be getting around pretty. It must. It looks seems to me with a hundred total people there, right? Mm-hmm. Which is sort of how many people were in the yard. Um, that's not a big facility. You could no. you could fit that inside of a small school. You know, mm-hmm. you can get from one home room to the other in a minute and a half. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and the dorm rooms they seem kind of modestly sized. Mm-hmm. Um, they do separate the kids between male and female, but beyond that, there's really no organization. Right. Yeah. It's Evil fascinating. Hogwarts. I don't know how much more time we're going to be spending in Balvinger, but I feel like we've got a pretty good idea of what it is uh, and what's happening there and what the next steps or what Lyra's plan is ultimately going to be. Although with Mrs. Coulter arriving, that's kind of a significant wrench thrown mm-hmm. into her plan. Mm-hmm. Um, sneaking around when no one recognizes you is one thing. Sneaking around when two people, well, two two entities, Mrs. Coulter and the monkey, know who you are and know what you look like, that's a whole nother bag of worms. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of them is your mother. And, right. Uh, actually, both of them are your mother. Yeah. And- <laughs> Ooh, in- interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I like that. Here's a, a, another issue about the golden monkey. It's the only demon whose name we're, we're the only demon of that's been that engaged whose name we don't know. We ne- we will know. That's weird though that we don't yet. It's still the I, golden monkey. It is. It is weird. Like it's almost like she spent a month with her, or however long with her. Right. And wouldn't Lyra know it by now? That's how secretive Miss Culture is about her own demon. Right. Even accidentally finding out what what his name is. At no point does he just randomly say the name around Lyra. She's just no. He also doesn't talk. Like we don't. I right. don't believe that he talks. He he's he's voiceless. Um, so far. So far. Right. Um, he hasn't said anything yet, or or not audibly. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, yeah, that's that's that is interesting that we still don't know. The you know the the golden not even referenced as a as a monkey at the end of the chapter, just a golden image, right? Isn't it? What is what is it? Like just the golden demon, her golden demon. Maybe? Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah. I well, mean, I'm really, go ahead. Oh no, I I was going to move on. So if you have something to say, I'd rather. Oh, I was just going to say that I hope that demon talks and tells us some stories because I would like some tales of the gold monkey at some point. Nice. Yeah. Nice. yeah, yeah, you did. Like yeah, I that. did. Yeah, I'm Gen X ended up in the house. I'm <laughs> sure. Wow, impressive. Well, what was like? What I was gonna say was, um, you were talking about her, you know, her mother, and I love at the beginning of chapter 14 when they they she's thinking about her father and she's thinking about her mother, and again she has you know no problem. Um, she knows that, you know, Lord Ariel is her father and she calls him father. But it says, Mrs. Coulter was never mother. The reason for that was Mrs. Coulter's demon, the golden mm. monkey, who had filled Pantalaemon with a powerful loathing and who Lyra felt had pried into her secrets and particularly that of the alethiometer. Like, she doesn't dislike Mrs. Coulter for who Mrs. Coulter is is or what she's done she dislikes her and can't think of her as a mother because she's resentful of her demon yeah i find that to be really interesting it's like i mean it's kind of like you know when you defend your abuser like you like you know when you when you when you still love you know somebody who who's hurting you like where does this loyalty to her come from is what i'm trying to get at this but but at the end of the day isn't the demon a representative of who Mrs. Coulter is? She's not so, separating. So if she hates the demon, she hates Mrs. Coulter. I don't know. I, I feel like she's separating them. Mm. I mean, that's how I'm reading it. It's like mm-hmm. she's, she, you know, can't think of Mrs. Coulter as mother, but this, you know, external, external loci of control 
is it's that demon's fault. Mm -hmm. It's the golden demon's fault that I can't think of her as mother, you know, which again, maybe begs the question of how much um, independence and autonomy do demons have in the things that they do and they choose to do. Like obviously not every single thing that Panalaman does um, is dictated by Lyra, but it's certainly influenced by her. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, you know and, and that's, that's kind of how I, I'm seeing that, like reading that a little differently maybe. But you know, maybe she doesn't, maybe she d doesn't separate it, but I feel like she's using the monkey as a bit of a scapegoat. I, you know, you're probably right because what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, my interpretation a bit more and I think I'm interpreting it from my perspective perspective as a person who does not have a demon, <laughs> who, you know, where, where the demon is, you know, a representation of myself. But, you know, if you're reading this from the perspective of a person in that world where the demon is considered, uh, you know, a, a separate entity to a degree, it absolutely makes sense. Mm -hmm. It absolutely makes sense what you're saying, Joanna. Yeah, and I and I do. I would say for the record that I feel like they, that that demons have far more autonomy than I think. I think as we sort of read and get caught up in the story, we sort of. But I, I really do think that they have a little bit more. You know, there are times when Pantalaemon, again, whether or not he's influenced by Lyra, he makes very clear decisions that are his. Mm -hmm. Um, and often will go against her. And it's mm. not her necessary. It's not her fighting with herself. Like, I don't, I don't see it like that, that even though it's her soul, it's not, it's almost like, to me, I almost see it almost like a, like a soul mate. Mm -hmm. These mm. two, like, it's not like it's this other part of her that she's only connected to because of it has what she doesn't. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's more, it's just that this thing will fully understand me, all mm. parts of me. Mm -hmm. And therefore is my soul kind of like a soul mate. Mm -hmm. And for the record, and for the record, I do not believe in soul mates either. Just so you know. Okay. <laughs> I just had to say that cause I'm the least romantic woman I think in the entire world, but yeah. Yeah. I, I just imagine that uh, our audience member, Travis has just been crushed. <laughs> <laughs> he knew what he was getting on board for Travis. <laughs> uh, de just devastating. <laughs> uh, so uh yeah it's great um the we're leading into a ch <laughs> um it i feel like this is going to get a little intense um mrs culture's there Lyra is at any moment in danger of being intersized. Um, she is cooking up a plan to escape, not just her, but 75 kids. Uh, the Egyptians are barreling down. They were only two days away when they were attacked. Um, and thank goodness, uh, uh, Fartacorum is only a little bit hurt, right? Was it John Fa or Fartacorum? John, John Fa. Oh, John Fa. Yeah. He's he's mm -hmm. not gravely wounded, thank goodness. Uh, there feels it feels like the story is closing in on this. Like everyone is is coming into the witches are aware and close by. Um, obviously, Lyra and, and Pan are are in Balvangar, but but both the boys that she's looking for, she's connected with. M Mrs. Coulter landed. The gold monkey's there. The Egyptians are on their way there. This feels like a real propulsive, like this was one, you know, I stopped, I've been stopping reading where we, our discussions stop. And I, but this was one of the times when I really, really wanted to keep reading because this feels like there's a lot about to go down big time. Mm -hmm. If we thought a lot happened in the past two chapters, can you, you can only imagine what the next two are going to be like. Yeah, right. this was a straight up cliffhanger. This Holy moly. Awesome. Yeah. This was a fantastic place to stop. Yeah, oh. we are on the crux we are on the crux of the climax here. Yes. Like if I were if I were teaching my students, I'd say this is, you know, the this is like the best of the rising action, like right here. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna have one or two more things and then it's gonna be it's gonna be the big, you know. Yes. The big boom. And and it's yeah, it, I almost I and you're right, Alaric, it's like 
stopping is is hard you know suspend yeah waiting waiting for that you know because you build that the momentum was built so it was built up so beautifully in this chapter um you know that that pro it propels you propels you forward but that just gives us something to look forward to for the next two chapters oh man 16 my prediction for the next two chapters hit it armored bear armored bear armored oh. bear yeah. Big yes. time. Well, yeah. she she kind of she kind of threatens uh, the her her kidnappers with Yorick, <laughs> like uh, what he's gonna do to them. Mm -hmm. Very funny. And I love that they laughed. They're like, ha ha ha! You had a you had a bear, and we we still got you. Like they were like cracking up. It was hilarious. Oh yeah, and the, oh the image of the this is had to have gotten you, Travis. But when they're ambushed and Yorick just like barrels off into the darkness and starts mm -hmm. like wreaking havoc and like just there's just screams in the mm -hmm. distance yes. it's like ah oh, he's such a badass yes he is <laughs> <laughs> just at a moment's notice i mean of course he leaves behind his charge unfortunately um but, but there was murdering to do there was there was slashing and murdering to do exactly. and he's got to try out that armor get that get that stuff uh yeah that's right oh my god that was like thrilling you know you know when when Jon Snow is standing in the middle of the field alone um, in the Battle of the Bastards, and he, and the the cavalry is just running towards him, and he just like pulls out his sword and stands there. Uh, yeah, this that's that kind of big moment. Yeah, which by the way is my all time favorite like visual in almost any movie ever. So I I need something like that in uh, in this series. Agree. And in, in, involved uh, involving a polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness um any other pieces of of info or notes to to close out i think we got a pretty good yeah, read on it yeah covered. covered um we took a little break uh, thank you guys for for hanging with us we had a little summer a little extra summer week um to get get into these this this episode uh but we're i think back on schedule i think mm -hmm. i think uh, this you know we have school starting and whatnot but um i think i've uh i think we'll be sort of back on a regular schedule uh, still no um word on the uh, release date or the launch date for the show but i've seen some whisperings that it could be as late as november so um we are going to be finished with this book relatively soon uh and i think we're going to watch the film yeah that would yes. be uh, the next piece of this puzzle. Yes, yes. Um, so you guys have that to look forward to, and then we'll we'll jump into the subtle knife after that. I think. Nice. Why yes. wait, right? Let's do Why it. Why wait? Hip. I mean, come on. <laughs> Let's do this. We're gonna be like, uh, yeah, we're gonna be barreling ahead. It's gonna be great. Uh, I did want to shout out that the, the this trilogy, of course, is is what we're talking about, but. The Book of Dust, the, the following trilogy, The Book of Dust, which uh, the first book is out and the, and the second book is, um, is coming out in, uh, I think, in October, maybe. Uh, the audiobook, did I mention this already? The audiobook is going to be read by Michael Sheen. Wondrous. Uh, which, fabulous. come on, give me more of that. Oh, for nice. real? Nice. I mean, yeah, sign me up for some Michael Sheen. Oh, that sounds excellent. I mean, how great was he in Good Omens? Best part of this. Well, I, I was going to say the best part, but we had David Tennant. So. I know, but you know what? Here's, here's the thing. And David Tennant played it beautifully. It's wonderful. I mean, yeah. he's, he was amazing. But I think it's, it's easier to be a devil who has a little bit of good in you than it is to be an angel who has a little bit of bad. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know... David Tennant just was just again was a, a phenomenal, but Michael Sheen's performance was so subtle, so yes. subtle, and, so and, good and, and that it was and it was just perfection. It was just perfection, in, in a way that you know, I, I want more of him. Oh, yeah. It was one of those performances that I have a difficult time distancing myself from. So when I see Michael Sheen, it's very easy to imagine that he is a zero fail. Yes. Sure. You know, you know tenant gonna tenant. You know, he's right. he's giving he's giving you full tenant. He's yes. going he, the full. He really tenant. did. Right. Uh, oh. But Sheen, you know, in, in particular, the scene where he gets a hold of the book, and he's reading the passage about him 
reading the book mm -hmm. and his sort of realization of what is happening and like him looking around and like the sort of shock of what's like what he's gotten himself into it's i mean we're, what are we talking about why are we we're talking about good omens right now but um <laughs> that that bit is just tr he's he's perfect in that role I, who else are you gonna cast yeah yeah yeah, yeah. nope you know, we're talking about Good Omens on a um, His Dark Materials show, but I, I really feel like the Venn diagram for the fans of both. There's a is, connection is, there's point. There's a significant overlap. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, that was just wonderful. I, I watched the series twice. I liked it so much. Um, and it's it's wonderful. Uh, so hopefully this series will have the same amount of... Uh, I mean, if it has half of what Good Omens has, it sh it'll be a big hit. And everybody's oh. going to love it. Oh. Uh, but there's a lot... There's a lot of... I mean, these... This book is is really wonderful. It doesn't have that game and whimsy, I guess. Right. No. I would say there's a lack of whimsy in this mm -hmm. book, mm -hmm. um, but the the richness and the textures and and what happens and the characters. There's so many wonderful characters that are so well drawn that it's a real thrill to sort of think that someone's going to give it a treatment where we're going to get to spend eight to ten hours absorbing this uh, as opposed to two hours you know we're going to yeah. get a real we're going to really be able to live in this world I'm, I'm tremendously excited yeah this feels like the ya novel that all ya novels wish they could be mm. and um i, I it's it's it, i'm having a good time in this world I it's really not am. you know it, it 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 is kept in the ya section in mm -hmm. most bookstores it's kept in the YA section of most libraries, mm -hmm. but this would be a, a real discussion topic that I would be interested to talk to you guys about is, is this YA fiction to you? Isn't it just a fantasy epic? Where, where does, is, is it only because it is an 11 year old girl in the lead? Uh, you know, you've I mean, got the, the, the girl fighting the dystopian, um, the monolithic dystopian entity, you know, in the form of the magisterium, um, you know, there, there was actually something that you talked about earlier, um, where she walks into, uh, this, that black and white world is like this technicolor person, which I think by the way, was a fantastic turn of phrase. And, uh, it reminded me of, um, gosh, uh, a wrinkle in time. Mm hmm. You know, same thing happens. You've got uh, the girl goes into the world where everything's monotonous and she's the one who gives it the spark. Same thing happens in, um, uh, gosh, Mockingjay and all those other things. Uh, Hunger Games. Hunger, Hunger Games. Games. Yeah. You know, she, she lights up the world when she gets there. Uh, you've got your Divergent series where she's the one who changes everything. So I think there are pretty significant elements that – you know, why a has adopted from this series mm -hmm. that, um, kind of tie it to that genre. But, um, you know, I, I do think, and, and I, I know that there are a lot of fans of YA who are, uh, gonna, you know, throw things at me for this, but I do think that the, the, the sheer quality of this transcends that overall genre. And the the richness of that world. Mm. I, I love YA fiction. Me too. Um, and particularly like YA fantasy, um, more than realistic fiction. Um, you know, I, I love fantasy and sci-fi mm. fic. Um, and there's a flavor to it that this book lacks. And I don't mean that. It's not a detriment to this book. I, mm -hmm. You're right, Alaric, when you say there there is there is a seriousness to this book, um, which that doesn't mean you can't be serious in a young adult book. And Neil Gaiman has whimsy and he writes adult fiction and he also writes young adult fiction. And he writes children's books and he writes picture books. Mm -hmm. um, but there is, there is a, a level of, of seriousness to this world that for me, I, I feel like it's put into this genre because of who the main character is, but not because it has other, um, other traits that would maybe define it as, as, as YA. Um, because if we were really doing it 
based on, you know, she, it would be young reader because she's 11. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like if it was about mm -hmm. who she was as a character, like just because that's who that that is, it doesn't make it a young reader book either. It's it's way more complex, way too complex. Mm -hmm. um, and yet the character is 11. So, yeah, I, I mean, I would say as somebody who absolutely loves YA fiction, I don't I don't see it. It doesn't bother me if people consider it that. But I don't think I I do. In the end, I don't think I consider right. it. Right. Like YA. Lord of the Rings is not considered YA, right? Right. Um, right. Not to say this is, you know, I don't want to compare these two, but uh, another fantasy epic trilogy that has a zillion characters and a rich world and you sort of, you know, is it just, is, is fantasy, is sort of popular fantasy automatically going into YA now? Like, is that how it sort of is always going to be pushed? Are there fantasy books that are sort of above the YA pay grade that are still coming out or are writers sort of writing towards that YA description? They want to sort of be in that, in that financial little chunk. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Well, this would be a good expansion episode. Yeah, sure. In, in which we could bring in some booksellers and librarians and teachers and we need, well, we have we have a teacher already, so we do have a teacher. We do. We got a teacher. Good one, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> we have a teacher and a the, the director of studio operations for a dance company. I could talk about dan the dance in this book. When when we get to it, I'll talk about the dance. <laughs> I can't wait till they get to the government consulting point. Part of the book. <laughs> oh, my God, hurry up, Pullman. <laughs> I can tell you for sure as a teacher when they pulled out that list and there was no order to it, I just cringed. I just I thought, thought of you. I, thought I was of you like, oh my God, yeah. what are these people doing? And it's, there's a real it. awareness of it too. It's <laughs> like they they don't know, you know, they, everybody's on one list. Come on. Oh my God. They didn't know where the clothes were. I was like, come on, people. Oh, and legit, people are Get just given, ran, you know, she just gives a <laughs> random name. Like, how do they even know who these kids' names are? They're just like, what's your name? And they're like, they could say anything. Yep. No Sometimes I would assume don't even know here. their last name, right? True. Right. No, so, no okay. information assurance, no verification, no validation. No. Ugh. Yeah, uh, it's wild. Yeah, no blood has been drawn. Um, this is uh, this has been an educational episode. I appreciate you guys' time this uh, late this Sunday night. This always, always yep, always a pleasure. Super fun. Uh, so we'll uh, see you next week when we dive into the next two chapters of uh, The Golden Compass. And um, you guys have a wonderful week. Take care, y'all. Have a good night. <laughs>